So hello and welcome to this session uh, convened to explore what what stories we should be telling ourselves in a climate emergency. I can see you all flooding in right now as you do. Um, please do say hello to each other in the chat function. You can tell us uh, your name and where you work and um, what country what country you're from. Maybe you could brag this might be your uh, tenth Zoom of the day. You wanted a bit of showing off about that. Perhaps you're a complete Zoom virgin by some miracle. Um, whoever you are and however many Zooms you've had today, you um, are very, very welcome. So I can see there's 100 of us in this meeting at the moment. And I did a sustainability session last week with four panelists and one attendee. So this is already, we're off to, we're off to a good start in terms of, uh, <laughs> in terms of attendees and people who are gonna be joining this uh, conversation. Um, so also please do remember that this is a Zoom webinar, not a Zoom meeting. So we cannot see you. So whether you're sitting at your desk or you're in bed with a glass of wine, eating a pot noodle, or whether you're sitting in the director general's office, we don't mind. You just can make yourself make yourself comfortable. Um, we're very happy that you've uh, that you've joined this session, uh, whatever whatever you are doing. So as I said at the start, we're here to question what stories we should be telling ourselves in an ecological emergency and crucially, how they should be told. Welcome to all of you. Um, I know a lot of you are from the UK, some from Europe um, and other people elsewhere, but a special hello to our friends joining us um, from the USA. One of the problems with climate storytelling was surely the lack of a bad guy. Every story needs a bad guy. And one arrived four years ago and occupied the White House. And I think we're all happy that chapter is now coming to a close. So again, a special hello and thank you um, to our friends in America for making that possible. My name is Aaron Matthews. I'm head of industry sustainability um, at BAFTA. I run the Albert Project and I am a geographer. I'm also 35, which means I will retire in 2050, the very year that we cruise into net zero globally. Um, and, and I promise I'm going to be here for the duration. So if you want to get me off your screens more quickly than that, just lean into the climate narrative and, I, and I'll be gone as, as, as soon as we as soon as we get there. So what on earth does a geographer know about storytelling? Well, I know that the societal narrative we're currently telling ourselves about the way we live is not one that the planet can sustain. I also do quite a lot of reading on this topic. And I think one piece of research, which is especially important um, for our discussions here today has come out of the Norwegian Research Centre. They've hypothesised that one of the key ingredients to effective climate communication is that we have to believe we can inhabit and embody the stories that we are told. They have to be believable. We have to be able to imagine ourselves as the protagonist. Personally, I do believe we will manage to keep humans on this planet, and I believe that the TV industry will play a pivotal role in making sure that that happens. But that's me. I'm also joined by some fantastic speakers and guests to kick off uh, this session. So here is the format for the next hour or so. Firstly, I'm going to share with you some of the key findings of the subtitle report, subtitles to save the world that we have put out today. Then I'm going to hand over to the fantastic climate and economic expert Angela Francis. I first heard about Angela by watching her TED talk, which I really encourage you to do the same. I think we can put her link in the chat there, uh, which is entitled Saving the Planet Without Making It Everyone's Top Priority. I saw this video and I thought, ah, oh, we're going to be friends. So I emailed Angela and I said, can we be friends? And I think we are. Uh, she's here to be friends with all of us here today. So thank you, Angela, for, for joining us. Um, Angela's Chief Advisor of Economics and Economic Development at WWF. And we're delighted to have her share her insights on engaging the public with climate change and the TV industry's critical role on this agenda. We've also got some brilliant, my favourite commissioning editors in all of TV land, I would say. We've got Lara Keiju, um, commissioning editor for Daytime ITV, Manda Levin, senior commissioning editor, um, BBC Drama, Fiona McDermott, head of comedy at Channel 4, and Richard Watson, director of commissioning at UK TV. We're going to be discussing the realities of getting the climate stories um, into our content, along with appraising some recent planet placement examples that we've seen. And in case you weren't at the launch of Planet Placement last year, you missed a good party. There was cake, there was powerful speeches, there was sustainable party bags, and we promised to get back to those kind of events as soon as we can. We developed Planet Placement um, with our wonderful friends at Futera. 
uh, and it's a resource, if you haven't found it already, for content creatives, a guide to bringing planet, the planet into the programming, whatever your genre. Because for us, as far as we're concerned, almost every program um, we make can have a conversation and help make um, climate change feel normal. Even his dark materials, no spoiler alerts if you haven't seen uh, episode two. <laughs> also, um, please do, as I said before, please do join in the chat. Please do ask Q&A. We're also live on Twitter, um, Facebook and Instagram. So whether you hate what we're saying, you like what you're saying, please do get involved um, and like or share or even report if you think we're off our rocker. We're not yet on TikTok. Um, although perhaps that could be a sustainability objective for us next year. If you, if, if you promise to watch a dance on climate change, I promise to do it for you next, uh, next year. We're also gonna be taking questions from your Q&A throughout. So Tricia is gonna be moderating those and popping in um, to ask our panelists questions um, as, as we go through. So please do um, engage with us and chat, chat amongst yourselves. It's the easiest way to lift our message. So I'm just gonna say goodbye to our lovely panelists for, for a very moment and then kick off um, with some of the key findings of our report, subtitles to save the world. Right, share my screen. So first up, the methodology of what we did with subtitles to save the world. Well, we looked at a whole year of content, <laughs> which is quite a lot of files actually. Um, and we, we um, got sample data from BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Sky, uh, BBC. Oh, I missed one there, anyway. Um, and we looked at comedy, entertainment, drama, and factual. And this equated to over 250 thousand unique episodes and files. We worked with the brilliant guys at Deloitte in order to make this possible and they said that this was the biggest data set that they have ever dealt with. <laughs> so to kind of give you some idea of the complexity um, of the challenge in hand. And with all of these files we analysed um, them for the presence of 25 key environmental terms, terms that come you know, uh, considered important under the Committee on Climate Change and also um, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And this is what we found. Firstly, a highlight from what we found when we did the uh, results last, well, last time in 2018, we found that there were 3,000 mentions um, of climate change um, within our data set, and that roughly equated to a similar number as urine, zombies and rhubarb. Was 2018 a good year for rhubarb? I don't know. <laughs> but what the key message here is um, it's there, but it's really quite low down the list as a topic that we talk about in entertainment and entertainment genres. Fast forward a whole year, and goodness, things have changed hugely. We see climate change four times more frequently discussed in our entertainment, our comedy, our drama, and our factual programming. But still, in context, the rider, the rider story. Um, uh, you know, similar to, to rap nonsense and poo. Now was 2019 a good year for nonsense? Not sure, I am waiting in tenterhooks to see what 2020 is going to be. And we promise to get those results to you uh, as soon as we can, hopefully in, um, in, February, in February next year. Another kind of example to kind of contextualize how often we talk about environmental terms. So this was climate change. Another word that we looked for was carbon, uh, was carbon footprints. And we found that within that 29 data set where we talked about carbon footprints 600 times and for context footsteps 14,000, toes 12,000 um, and socks kind of uh, up there. So in context, you're, you're you know, hugely more likely to hear about those topics than you are about um, carbon footprints. So this must kind of have, have us wondering, really, how can we navigate the greatest challenge ever set toward, towards high, um, humanity if we're just not talking about it? If it's absent from our culture, you know, we're told we, uh, we're changed by what we see on screen, and I certainly believe that. So how can we possibly begin to grapple with these, um, with these evidence, uh, with, the, with, the, with these findings and move forward? One thing um, I think it's important to note really is that what we're not asking for here is for climate change and the word carbon footprint to be rudely inserted into all genres. What we're looking for is an authentic um, creative response to, uh, to integrating sustainability, whether that be planting trees or whatever uh, across, across messaging. And we've tried this time to uh, do a completely different way of measuring uh, integration with something called um, a planet placement score. 
So here we built libraries of terms around homes, food, travel, products and society, because these are the key issues that we need to grapple if we, you know, they're the key largest parts of our carbon footprint. So we tried to understand of all of our files when these particular topics were being discussed. And we said, well, if, if we find breakfast and we find lunch and we find ingredients and we find parsnip or bacon, whatever, and we find seven of those particular references, we're gonna guess that that's a food program. Once we've got those labels, food, home, travel, we then um, try to look how often an environmental term was brought alongside that as, um, you know, as a discussion. So how often are we bringing the planet, how often are we placing the planet alongside these key transition um, areas? And this is what we found. Um, on average, 18% of the time, um, when we're talking about one of these key themes, are we finding one environmental term alongside? Um, but if you look for a slightly more meaningful integration, you know, when do we find two terms? 9% of the time, and when do we find three terms, uh, three environmental terms on one of these areas, 6% of the time. So that's the key question for today, isn't it really? Is it okay to talk about the planet only 6% of the time on one of the areas that is absolutely critical to our transition to net zero? How can we make sure that climate change feels a normal part of society and perhaps even as normal to talk about as money? We can also see that we're pushing in the wrong direction as well in terms of other high carbon activities. So we talked about climate change 13,000 times, but we talked about planes and flying 43,000 and, and cooked with beef in a recipe 21,000 times. It's really important to note as well that the Committee on Climate Change in the UK says that we have to reduce our meat intake by 20%. So this isn't all about becoming vegans overnight, but it is more about uh, you know, an integrated approach to storytelling um, across, the, across the whole piece. So there we are, that's our subtitle findings. And now I'm going to uh, introduce you to the wonderful Angela Francis from WWF. So Angela, I wonder if you could kick off by telling us uh, what you thought of those findings and then let us know what you, what you have to say. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so delighted to be with you um, today. And, and yes, that I have a new friend, <laughs> very, very excited. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm going to kind of reflect on a number of the things that you spoke about during my during my remarks because we chatted before this and uh, yeah, we, I think we're of, of one mind that there's so many um, positive things that will come out of achieving climate change that we don't have to preach to people, um, but we can instead talk to them about how um, how the environment can change their lives in lots of positive ways, and that might be a much better way to to communicate the kind of change that we're going through. So I was going to start my remarks by saying. Um, just reflecting on 2020. I don't know how your 2020 has been, but I feel like I'm really living through history and it's quite a weird feeling. Um, 2020 is definitely going to be a year that's written about in the history books. And even by the standards of the last 20 years, which have been pretty crazy, you know, 9-11, rise of Facebook and Twitter, first black president, first orange president, Brexit, Arab Spring, Ebola, fires in the Amazon and Australia, you know, even compared to all of that, which, which we're kind of used to seeing, 2020 has still been a really big year. And what I wanted to say was, what's going to be written about 2020 um, in the history books is not determined by what's happened so far, it's going to be determined by what happens in the next two, three, oh, three years. Whether 2020 is seen as a turning point for better health systems and international cooperation on vaccines, um, whether it's a change in what we value as individuals or societies, or will it be the point that conspiracy theories take hold and people separate and isolate to feel safe? Which futures of, uh, we get, which of those futures we get, um, how 2020 is seen is all going to depend on what people are making the case for, who is persuading the public, and what stories are capturing our imagination and giving people something to believe in. So I'm here to talk about my role in that as an economist, and to invite you to think about your role in TV and film, because these big economic moments are really big social moments too. And if there's any doubt about how big this moment is economically, um, the global recession that we're seeing in 2020 and that will um, kind of hit us as well next year is the biggest since World War II. 
and that's more than twice as big as the recession that followed the global financial crisis in 2008 and, and we know what that felt like it's absolutely huge and as i say these big moments big things can happen and you know to give an example of um after the second world war which was the last change of anything like this size the UK was already in, in a um, consensus that it was a time for big change. And so the Conservative government brought in free education for all. Um, the Labour government that came in just after them brought in a new system of social welfare, state pensions, national health service. This was like a revolutionary moment. It was right across society. So we, we, there is that level of change possible now as well. And one of the things I want to happen as a result of 2020 and the economic crisis we're living in now is to see a green economic recovery. I want the UK and I want countries around the world to um, build back better from an economic crisis that was caused by COVID and invest in net zero and in a restoration of nature in a way that accelerates that transition that Aaron's been talking about, the transition to a green economy. So circular use of materials, um, reducing waste, getting our power from renewable sources and not taking more from nature than can be regenerated. And that process of greening our economy, meeting our climate chart targets, is something that UK was signed up to long before 2020, but it's not delivering on it yet, and, and nowhere is. But I'm hopeful that this is a moment that can accelerate progress, because there's already this widespread consensus, like the consensus we had after the World War II, that green recovery is the best recovery. So we had the student global student strikes led by Greta Thunberg last year, the um, Extinction Rebellion actions, grandchildren and grandparents saying that action is urgent. So that was quite had a different reaction than previous previous kind of protest and got a lot of popular support. We had um, in May this year, Nick Stern, whose name you might recognize, he was working with a set of economists uh, to survey bankers, um, treasury officials, economic experts to work out what were the best policies that we needed to recover from COVID. And the policies they found, which were the quickest to implement and had the most positive economic effect, also had the biggest climate benefits. So they were focusing on clean infrastructure, retrofitting buildings to make them more energy efficient, investing in natural capital, so things like forests and soils, and clean research on um, clean research and development to improve innovation in our economy. And in um, June of this year as well, 200 businesses wrote to the Prime Minister asking for a clean and just recovery. That wasn't just renewable businesses, it was HSBC, it was Tesco's, it was Siemens and Scottish Power. And that's not surprising because these businesses were already thinking about how they would move towards net zero before COVID and it makes sense with their long-term plans. So this is the kind of long-term change that we're moving to. And I'm gonna come back to some more economic stories in a minute, but I quickly want to turn to talking about your role in determining what kind of future we get after 2020. And the first thing is to say, as Aaron was saying, do something. At the very least, TV and film should be reflecting the issues and societies around us. But more than that, it can lead. And you're going to know how to do this more in your programming than I will. But I would suggest you should be asking, what is your role in helping your audience navigate and understand some pretty big changes over the next few years? How will you increase understanding? How will you make people feel hopeful and inspired? How will you change the re reflecting um, aspirations of what is a good life? We know people have a different view about that. Um, and we need to show that in, in programming. WWF has some experience of doing this in natural history programming. So we worked with um, David Attenborough and the Alastair Fothergill team on Our Planet and Our Life on Our Planet, which both came out um, in the last couple of years. Uh, and they were that team were very smart and they were already filming a completely new type of natural history programming that dealt with environmental issues. Um, at that point that the marine plastics moment happened in Blue Planet, if you remember the images of um, a seahorse with a plastic cotton bud exploded all over the media and there was, you know, a real, a real need for change as a result of that. The conventional wisdom up to that point was that audiences did not want to see the destruction of nature. They wanted perfect wildernesses, huge flocks and herds, no connection to the fact there was a habitat loss or extinction threat to many of the species that we were talking about. And that just turned out not to be true. And five of the lessons that our content team learned from that experience is that you can give people the truth. You can create an emotional connection. The connection is not always a lion chasing a gazelle. It can be about an orangutan and deforestation. 
you need to show uh, the connection to the UK and don't assume that people understand that. Sometimes people need to be met where they are and, and told a story about why something's happening in another part of the world or to another to a species they don't know about is affecting, um, they, they are affecting it. And show solutions and success and things, things that might seem new can be normalized and be part of our lives. And then finally, use analogies um, like planetary health and healing so that we can talk about change in a way that people see that change is possible and achievable. And the way they sum that up is about hitting the heart and the head and then empowering. And that's kind of the natural history lesson that, we're, that we've, we've had in our TV work, but my work is in a slightly different space. So as well as inspiring um, passion in nature, WWF also work on the solutions. And we also know they have to work for people and that's where my work sits. So let me share a little bit of that. Um, most of the solutions that we're talking about are changes in human systems. So they're not in the Serengeti, they're in the UK, they're the way we travel, what we eat, how we build our houses, how we light and heat them, the materials we make products from and the way, ways we deal with waste. Those are the things that fixing, um, fixing those things are the things that change the situation for the environment and nature. And the first thing to say is in all of that, dealing with climate change and nature loss, even if you didn't care about the environment is worth it economically. The cost of not keeping the planet to one and a half degrees is huge. Um, by acting, you avoid all those costs of flood and agricultural losses, and you improve health and well-being. And those calculations have been done um, for, for, for years by scientists and economists, and they're based on the most prudent estimates, not even counting all the innovation and cost savings we expect to get along the way. And those um, benefits are true for the UK and for the, and for the planet. So we know the process of change is hard, but we know it's worth it. And we know we've been through changes like this before. So one of the economists um, I love in this topic is Carlotta Perez. And she looks at transformational industrial change. So the industrial revolutions, when we went from steam power to electrification, we've had mass production and the rise of cars and to the information and communication revolution that we're now in. Each one has got this pattern of furious uptake of new technology and then some kind of reset or crash and then you have this painful turning point where we work out the mature phase and what's called like the golden age and we've mastered this new approach to production and we're about to go into one of those new phases now a new industrial revolution where we have to produce things sustainably and Perez says you need two things to make that navigation happen successfully one you need the government to set the direction for a new economy that they want, and then they need to tax the bad stuff and encourage the good stuff. And that's the policy work we do. But you also need these new lifestyles to emerge. And what she says, which is really interesting, I think, is what starts off as an elite lifestyle very quickly becomes mainstream. So things that are trends at the top of the income scale, um, at the top of the education scale, that the young adopt first, those lifestyles become mass lifestyles, not because we force it, but through desire and aspiration. Um, and in talking about these kind of changes that we're going to experience, I focus on the environmental action and policy that can improve people's lives, because it's not about forcing people, forcing a horrible lifestyle on people. It's about selling them on the better opportunity um, of what um, addressing the climate crisis and nature crisis can do, the things it can make possible. Particularly, I focus on the renewal of left behind towns, easing congestion, reduce it, reducing child obesity, all those other things that we have to worry about. And we have a responsibility to deliver change in a way that works for people. But frankly, we're not going to be effective in delivering any change if we don't take people with us. So it's really important to tap into the mood of the country. Um, and at the moment, we really need unifying causes. We really need to give something people can be proud of. And ideally that thing should be something forward looking, something they can shape and engage with. And the green economy is one of those things. So I'm gonna talk about one industry, housing and construction. And this is the tomorrow's world bit, which won't make sense to anybody who's not from the UK, but the tomorrow's world bit where I want to say something about how new homes and buildings will change over the few, next few years. Um, first of all, there's gonna be big changes in the way we heat our homes. And we've had that before, like central heating, um, which in the 1970s when I was born was only in 30% of houses and quickly went to 60% of houses in 10 years after that and up to 90% of houses by the, by the year 2000. It happens quite quickly. The next change is going to probably be even quicker and it's going to happen around heat pumps or even reverse heat pumps where we get heating and cooling systems in a, in a UK home, which 
might not have seemed like a priority, but if we can remember last summer, a cool home in the summer is an increasing benefit and something that people will want. And what we're finding now is after you've taken the installation cost into consideration, which needs to happen at the right time for that house, a reverse heat pump is already more efficient, um, energy efficient and economically efficient than having a separate air conditioner and a gas boiler. And these are the types of things that people are gonna be showing off about having in their homes. Energy bills, um, I would say are also gonna change. A new generation of homes um, and homes that have been retrofitted, made more efficient, can actually be net positive. Right? They can give us more energy than they use. So a house, um, houses are being built in, in Wales, it's called a Salsa house, and there's a Victorian terrace in Birmingham that have no fuel bills at all. They make money for their family um, by selling energy into the grid. So your home could be earning you money and you could be, um, that could be really significant for social housing tenants, families on low incomes, not having to worry about bills. There are already mortgages which give you a better mortgage rate if you are in a home that's energy efficient because you're a better customer, a lower risk customer for the bank. So all these things about you know bills arriving and somebody paying a bill, th these kind of narratives will change and kind of make people want to have a house that's really energy efficient. And I'm going to finish here um, by just sharing three bad ideas with you, which I which I was um, brainstorming in coming to this um, coming to this session just to get you thinking about what a positive vision for the green economy could be. Um, one is um, a remake of Kinky Boots, if you know that film, which was a Northampton shoe factory that got a second lease of life by making boots for gorgeous drag queens who couldn't get a kind of a glamorous boot in their size. So in this version, you potentially have a son or daughter or a factory owner who comes back to their hometown and turns around the fortunes of a factory, saves the jobs of the workforce by bringing in this whole new energy efficient, water efficient process and makes the firm you know, successful again. And Kinky Boots is based on a real true story. And there's actually some true stories I could share with you that, that, that tell that story about how a factory was saved by, uh, by bringing in energy efficiency and a whole new way to, to, to production. My other one is um, a remake of Alfie Zane Pets, and I'm, I'm aging myself here as well, um, where a group of construction workers in that original story go to a construction site in Dusseldorf and have all sorts of adventures. In this version, you could have a group of construction workers who go to a, a clean off-site production uh, site in the UK, a completely different world. They're building in high-tech environment, prefab steels, it's all uh, data and, and material measurement, and that is reducing waste and dust pollution, a, a very interesting and different environment for probably most builders in the UK. And then they could go and build homes in, in a new community that needs homes that have no bills and, you know, the adventures that are, are, are seen from there. There's also a true story about um, a construction company that's doing that, building, building homes in a factory and then taking them to site. And my last one is um, a remake of Grand Designs, which is rather than one house, you have a whole street that might come together um, and make their area a nicer place to live, safer for the children to play with more trees and plants um, and shared car spaces. All those things um, I think could be uh, interesting ideas, but I'm sure you'd come up with much better ones. And I've made the offer to Aaron that we would love, WF would love to host you and, uh, um, and a set of um, scientists and policy experts to co-create some stories about the future. Um, but whatever you're doing, I think it's all about making 2020 that turning point for something better. So yes, we'd love to work with you on that. Thank you very much. Angela, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Hit them in the hit them in the heart, hit them in the head, and then empower them. This is the classic story arc. I think I think you're a natural. Thank you so much for for um, for that insight into into your world. And I know we're going to be bringing you back a little bit after we've heard from our um, our commissioning editors. So next, uh, and Aaron, and... we just uh, jump in as a raving reporter. While oh, I'm okay. Hello, talking. Tricia. Have you got? Is this a question for Angela or? Yeah, it's a question for Angela. Actually, um, I just thought it'd be useful to kind of put a couple of these things out here because they're quite big questions and um, there's been so many questions so I apologize if I don't get um, round to all of them um, but first of all a couple of people have come on to say that they would watch your remake particularly the Kinky Boots remake so I thought that was really important they're not terrible ideas at all you've got an audience ready made for those um, but um, one of the questions that's come up and I should think you might have a point of view on and I and this is a really key topic for um, the industry as a whole is um, how um, uh, disabled people's accessibility can be part of the conversation about climate change, uh, because there are very important changes going on in travel and transport to tackle the issue, but it has a significant impact on the independent accessibility of, of some disabled and elderly people. 
Um, and she went goes on to say the media does have an important role to, to play in this. So I thought it'd be just useful to get your comment on that before we move on to the panel, if I may. Yeah, I, I, so I'm not an expert at all on this, but I can share two, two instances where I know this is a big part of the conversation. So one, there's a fantastic uh, site in, um, in, I think it's in Watford, called um, the British Research, Research Establishment. And what they do is, is put people in fake houses and, and get them to experience what it's like to live somewhere that's got all this energy efficient technology. And the interesting thing they do is they have energy efficiency and they have health uh, monitoring data. So a house that has you know, potentially um, uh, nurse support or, or access or, or different features for disability. And those things are things that can be tested. And it'd be quite interesting to see. I'm sure they have got lots of experience about how, what things you do to make a home um, function for somebody who's got disabilities that also uh, works for their um, works in terms of energy efficiency. But it's interesting that those are you know features that happen. And the other one I think that's interesting is some great conversations that have happened around um, shared transport and and the and the kind of the tension that lots of families experience when um, a relative's getting older and can't drive themselves anymore, and how um, actually having much more um, accessible and frequent um, almost a sort of dial a bus sort of like, oh it's like I suppose it'd be like an uber kind of model but where you have um, transport that could be shared um, and as available for people who can't drive themselves for whatever reason I think there's lots of interesting things around you know being tied to a car which actually aren't enormously helpful for people who uh, start to not be able to see so well or, 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 or look after a car so well so yes, I think it would be a really interesting area to explore because not only are we um, experiencing climate change we're also experiencing an aging an aging um, population and and increasing uh, demands for disabled people to have more access so all those things need to come together thank you very much for that i'll pop out for now and save the rest for later cool thank you watford wolford could that have been a freudian slip maybe can we get any standards <laughs> don't know let's uh, let's see okay right on to on to our panel manda lara uh, fiona and richard so um i'd like to ask you all the same question to start off actually just to kind of say hello introduce yourself to um to our lovely attendees and just to talk a little bit about how environmental content interacts with your professional job or how you might like it to in the future manda just starting with you Oh no, don't start with scripted. I think scripted the most challenging area. Oh, we, we love a challenge. Let's hear it. Come on. <laughs> so, yeah, I work in the in the drama commissioning team at BBC, um, but I also am part of a sort of cross-genre group at BBC that meet regularly to talk about sustainability. Um, and I, I, I'm very keen that we get the message out there to the creative community that that we think this matters. It's as simple as that, that we think it matters. And, and and there are different ways we can um, be useful. One, one is practical about getting, trying to get as many of our indies, uh, our productions Albert certified as possible. And one is, of course, editorial, which, which, which again, you can put in two buckets. There's the bucket that is um, demonstrating good, and modeling good behaviors just in the warp and the weft of the programming. And the other is how on earth does drama and scripted look in the face the climate crisis and tell stories that don't feel too dystopian and only end up preaching to the converted and that's the thing that keeps me awake at night and that we think about <laughs> all the time but actually i was listening to um the podcast that david olishoga has done with interviewing barack obama about his new book this morning and it just struck me again how obama just manages to, to look at very difficult things very honestly and truthfully, but do what you do on your sessions, Aaron, which is take people out the other side and say, don't, we have to feel empowered and that we have agency in this. And I think we're all, our, our superpowers, content creators, all of us and everyone watching is in narrativizing. So we have to find the right ways and the best ways to narrativize this, that knowing that it matters so much to our audiences, but but giving, making sure that people don't end up feeling powerless and like it's, it's going to all just crash and burn and that's the end of it. But what don't don't start with scripted. You're, you're a pro. <laughs> I'm going to bring you the rest of our panel. Sticking with scripted, Fiona, like uh, say, hello. say hello to everyone. And like, if you could tell everyone a little bit about what you're doing at Channel 4 as well. Well, uh, so I run the comedy department at Channel 4 and like Manda, I think, you know, our intentions are so there, but it's so difficult to get this to happen in, in narrative in the same way. You don't have the... You don't necessarily have the opportunity. We have less scripted stuff on telly. 
how characters interact with this, especially in comedy, when you're trying not, not to preach the converted and not to bring people down in some sort of apocalyptic vision of, of, of like our future. It doesn't necessarily feel that comedy is the place where we're going to be, you know, um, I guess educating. I think one of the things that we're trying to do in our discussion with writers is just to go, tell us the truth of how people feel about this. Find the comedy in the anxiety, find the comedy in the worry, find the comedy in what do I do? How do I make a difference? And in the failure of that as well, I think the more we normalize it, the, the human response to how profoundly uh, massive this can be, the more we, we can do that in comedy. We definitely can't do what Blue Planet does and we definitely can't do what's docs and daytime and even like, you know, I think Amanda might talk about this, but soap opera is an incredible space for scripted to do something. You know, the daily topicality of that means there is loads of opportunity in, in, in soap opera, but um, uh, we, uh, so comedy is one thing aside. I want, I want jokes about it. I want characters that are anxious about it. I think that feels human. That doesn't feel exclusive. It doesn't push you away. Um, but within Channel 4, we're, we are trying to find, I think, as lots of the questions are talking about and that we're, that we're tapping into, ways to not make this feel alienating, ways to engage people in their, 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 the ways that they can make a difference. You know, make find find something to be proud of and what we can do. Find something that's part of your day to day. Um, so we're, we're I'm really keen to hear what other people are saying about it. Actually, um, Laura, what about you from a daytime perspective? How how's that playing out? Um, yeah. So hello, I am commissioning editor for daytime entertainment at ITV, um, and so I look after actually the afternoons and weekday mornings. So my colleagues in daytimes in the mornings, they have a really great connection with their audience their live programs and they do a lot of um, work around the environment and my in my area it's challenging but not impossible actually it's obviously much easier than drama and scripted to address sustainability um, so a lot of my programs are quizzes that's tricky but then there are opportunities to have questions around the environment within the quiz space um, but also I have a lot of cookery programs. Um, so for example, John and Lisa's Weekend Kitchen, they will regularly say, you know, um, as this is sustainable, we're using wax, beeswax instead of cling film, or we are making crisps out of the potato peelings, things like that. So that's, you know, a way that we can start to reflect what people are doing, but also inspire people really. Um, so I've seen I've seen a couple of environmental questions on the chase I have, and I'd love to know, yeah, do you know how they got there? Were they organic? Were they- were, um, I the like team? to believe, I like to believe it's all part of um, our kind of social partnership at ITV and how we ask all our producers um, to think about sustainability and to, you know, be, be our Albert certified, um, to think about the environment in terms of their editorial, um, and all of those things. So I like to think it's that. They have brilliant question writers, so they will know what will work for the show. And also, which is reflecting the real world that people are living in and people's concerns. Cool. Um, and last, lastly, Richard, I know you sit across all of these genres. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about UK TV's journey with Planet Placement and, and where you are now for your originals. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Um, we Well, we've had you in a couple of times, Aaron. <laughs> As you know, you've addressed the entire company a couple of times, uh, and you've you've walked through your brilliant uh, presentation. That has actually really hit home the amount of the, the response from people in all functions across the the business has been really impressive. Off the back of that, and I genuinely think it's really important for for the the, the messages and the um, and the kind of mission, I suppose, that we all share to be shared across everyone at UK TV. And what we've done um, beyond, you know, all of our shows are, um, it's, it's mandatory that they're uh, Albert certified uh, and all shows are um, uh, carbon zero. So we're, or, or sorry, carbon neutral. So we're um, offsetting where we can't reduce the carbon, of course. Um, but what we are doing is we're sitting down and we've done this for, for about, um, I don't remember when we started this now, but this is a conversation that, uh, that you and I had in a meeting room some time ago. We've sat down with every single producer before every single show that has been made for us and we've talked to them about uh, planet placement 
And, and so first of all, I think there's a really important message there in spreading the value of that um, initiative uh, and, and people understanding it. And we've talked to them about the value of it and we've um, talked to them about the value to us, importantly, of uh, irrespective of genre, of them finding ways to, to raise the issues of, um, of the climate crisis. And, and genuinely, the results have been impressive, um, whether it's drama, scripted comedy, comedy entertainment, you know, some, some genres are always going to be a bit easier. You know, we've got a um, fantastic specialist factual show called Expedition with Steve Backshall, uh, where he goes to parts of the world where no one's been yet. But even so, you can very clearly see the impact of climate change. Um, so, you know, there are, there are really simple shows like that that are uh, not simple, but, but are very much tackling it head on. But there are, um, I think, in every single show that we've made, there are opportunities to talk about stuff. So um, we've had comedy shows. We've had John Richardson's comedy show, uh, Ultimate Warrior, where he, he talks about one of his ultimate worries being, um, being um, global warming. Uh, we've had uh, Nish Kumar doing a lecture on 10 reasons uh, the world could end. And we've just, we've just sat with everyone and, and just had a bit of a chat before anyone's turned a frame, basically, and just thought as a group of people, as execs and commissioners together about how we can raise these things. And then the thing that we've uh, most recently signed up to, which I think I shared with you when, when we last spoke, was, was a meeting after production. So, uh, and I, this was the most blindingly obvious thing, and I don't know why we weren't doing it before. You know, I, I'm really pleased that we're meeting people before production, but actually we weren't following up. And so what we're doing now is we're, we're meeting people after production for a number of different reasons, editorially uh, to track um, diverse talent within productions, but also to talk about sustainability. And there is a degree of holding our producers feet to the flames, I'm afraid, and just, just gently reminding them of the value to us. And, and as I say, so far, the results have been really good. Fantastic. I don't don't need to, you know, apologise for holding those feet to the flame. You hold them there, Richard. That's 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 fine. I mean, you've all you've all seen <laughs> you've all seen the reports. We have made a massive surge forward, but we clearly have a massive massive way to go still. I wonder if you have any thoughts on whether we can rise to this challenge and, and whether we can really make climate change or environmental sustainability as normal as talking about money. Does it seem so far off? Amanda, I'm going to pick on you horribly. <laughs> um, I, I've ever since uh, you did it for the first time and it was so shocking, the result, mm -hmm. it made me super conscious all the time from radio and television of, 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 of the currency of, of, of anything that references climate. And I felt like the fires, the Australian fires around then, I, f I felt like myself as a viewer and listener, it felt like there was a sea change. And I kept thinking, oh, next time they do that, <laughs> it'll go right. Um, and, and of course the pandemic came along and has, it, it's, it's kind of obliterated everyone's eyes on the bigger thing really I think I think I think climate is now like this I talk about it like this boogeyman in the corner it's like the emperor's got no clothes on and there are all these things that get in the way of it that are urgent problems that are immediate like um Brexit before the pandemic but in behind them is the emperor and he's got no clothes on so I I do think I, I feel like it's got so much more currency and I feel like we are getting there but but the problem is the things that come along and get in the way and we can't let them get in the way and we have to um, in the way Angela was talking about, we have to hope that the big changes that are happening that are negative have all these other um, halo effects. That, that again, going back to agency, the idea that we all got together and as 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 a global community and and, and realised that the little things we did made a difference to to transmission of the virus and the whole debate around our behaviours, our small behaviours contributing to a bigger thing. I really hope there is a huge lesson that we will all extrapolate from that. And I think, you know, our job again with the, the platforms and the privilege that we've got is to help that happen. So I do feel actually more optimistic about it. I know, I jump in, of, uh, Aaron, with a question. Oh, here you are, Lo. Come on. Yes, I'm back in. A radio, She's back. <laughs> radio reporter. I was just really wanted to pose this question um, to you, Manda, and maybe to Fiona as well, because it's specifically targeted about uh, scripted. Um, and this lovely person, Siobhan, thank you very much, has said that she thinks scripted is really tough, but she saw an episode of Only Fools and Horses from 20 years ago recently, which had environmental topics included in proving that it can be done and be done well. <laughs> but she really wants to know from a scripted perspective how, as 
commissioning editors, you're encouraging this thinking and approach. And what can the creatives in the scripted genres do to help you? Well, um, uh, one thing that um, we are trying to do to, to help make it part of it mattering. So we've got an indie brief briefing day coming up for drama and we, we're going to have a little section on sustainability that's going to point people towards a larger session we're doing in the new year for indies that is um, non-genre specific that's about sustainability specifically so we're going to do that um, there's a there's a brilliant sustainability consultant in the BBC called Jeremy Mathieu and I'm trying to get him set up to do sessions with writers, the writers that are working in the writers room who are the writers of the future and similarly with writers on our continuing dramas and, and, and making sure that the people who are bringing us stories know that this matters and are thinking about it and thinking how to do it. Yeah. I, I read a lot of cli-fi trying to <laughs> trying to go how do we do that how do we, and I'm not sure that's the answer I think you can only you can only ever do that once anyway really every sort of generation but but there are there are other smaller ways or, or not smaller, but more lateral ways we can talk about story. And, and the, the other thing that I think is really important is metaphor. So without getting too yeah. sort of fluffy and drama about it, we use metaphor all the time in scripted to talk about big issues that matter, but but as a sort of Trojan horse. And that, that should be, the first thing we ask when we look at any story, whether it's period or contemporary, is, is how is it relevant today? How does that, this story speak to now? What's it telling us? What's useful? And, the, and, and again, there is nothing more useful than finding really lateral, clever ways of looking at all those questions of powerlessness and of solving big problems and of, of, of behaviours large and small that can, um, mean our audiences just it just naturalizes and becomes part of the air we breathe and it runs through all of what we do like a stick of rock so that's what i i would hope for i think we're, i think we're getting somewhere similar um at channel four i would say that i think we would we'd be fair in saying that we're a bit behind the other broadcasters in some respects but the ambition you know all the commissioners at the moment across the whole floor have a planet placement objective for the year which is embedded in what we're doing and how we're talking to producers how you know i think uh, back absolutely everyone when we first had that presentation from you aaron and the profound simplicity and impact of how you communicated what we have to do and our role in in, in helping um translate that to to ourselves <laughs> through broadcasting was uh was shocking actually and so the more conversations we have just around the vitality and the simplicity of planet placement I feel that that's a really, really important thing. And I think we're taking that to heart here. For me, there's something, I can't do it in the way that drama does it, but it's very effective for us through anything that's multi-generational. And I think what Angela was talking about as well, that the behaviours of the young adults now will become mass behaviours in the future. Mm -hmm. Getting a multi-generational cast to talk about how they come at the same problems and the same issues is is a brilliant thing that scripted can do and actually even in big big um, formats a factual end formats like gogglebox you get the same sort of effect where you get a ma multitude of points of view perspectives different places in the country different class all coming at different things with different with, with different points of views and it celebrates our difference and it and it without ramming it down your throat it tells you this is complicated but we can no, and I was just going to say the goggle box example. You know, what, what was more impactful? Was it watching the walruses tumble from the cliffs yeah, exactly. in, in Netflix, or was it watching Jenny's tears? tears you know, watching in, in it much in exactly the same that way same that thing. goggle box does. A it elevates Stand Up to Cancer sometimes. So when you watch celebrities watching the Stand Up to Cancer films, it gives you just that extra point of view, that extra layer mm -hmm. in how profound and unifying some of these issues are. I think entertain for me, I think it's all all the dispatches, all the news, all the small dots, all the current affairs in the world is not going to change people's hearts and minds about this. It has to be massive entertainment shows. It has to be big populist pieces. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would argue a bit that the Blue Planet plastic episode was so powerful because it happened by stealth in the middle of a brand that you knew was just was was your sort of like comfort blanket for them had been for 10 years you watched David Attenborough you saw those on a Sunday and then in the middle of it boom this is what you get no one turned on going oh do you know what I want I want an hour that tells me what I've done to the planet that's what I want now no one turns on to be told that they can't save the world 
So sometimes those really impactful things have to come in surprising ways. And so I would I, I would encourage all producers across all genres to think about how you you almost feed our vegetables to us in a way that isn't packaged in such a you fucked it up. Now you must do it. <laughs> you know, like no one's going to engage with that, I think. And, that, yeah, and that I know another it. another Anders's message that she didn't actually talk about today, but is kind of threaded through her TED talk, which is what if the next big thing isn't the next big thing, but a million little things, you know, and it, yeah. Lara, it seems like daytime has a massive role to play. You know, it's in our lives. You know, mm. I wonder what, what, what are your thoughts about that kind of mentality and the opportunity for daytime? I mean, I think that it, it kind of follows a little bit from what Fiona was saying. It's about entertainment, but it's also about a lot of our programmes about inspiring people to do things, to, to get interested in things or to learn about things. And so like on our Sunday mornings, we have um, Love Your Weekend with Alan Titchmarsh. So Alan's in a beautiful barn in Hampshire, um, spending time with celebrities, but also people who are, who are doing things that you might want to do or, or to learn about. And, and regularly he's talking about, you know, recycling, composting, um, you know, doing things that are sustainable, but as part of a package of things that we can all aspire to do and mm -hmm. that will make us feel good. So it's not about, it's not saying do this to save the planet. It's, it's saying do this because you will enjoy it. It will bring joy to your life. It will make you feel happier. Um, and I think that's a way to get the message across without banging, you know, banging people over the head with it. Fantastic. So rather than talk hypothetically, I'm going to show uh, us five examples of planet placement that we've seen in the last couple of months, actually. And then I'd just like to get your discussion on whether you think they're any good. And Richard, I'm going to come to you first, actually, just to prep you. <laughs> so the five the five examples um, that we want to talk about multi genre. The first was obviously I May Destroy You, you know, with climate change really woven through um, you know, this amazing, powerful, powerful drama, but typically, you know, incredi incredibly questioning um, the stereotypes of, of sustainability and, and kind of I'm trying to unpick that as a, as a way to, to take us forward. Kind of on Big Devil's Advocate, not many solutions in that program, but, you know, certainly an incredible way to, to, to speak to, um, to, to an engaged audience. Another one, Richard, that you referenced was climate change. Um, comedians doing lectures, sorry, um, with Nish Kumar lecturing climate change. You know, really, really fascinating way to bring it to uh, to a live audience. Next one, certainly pulling at the heartstrings. This one wasn't it? The the, the SOS from the kids on um, on Britain's Got Talent. You know, really humanising this issue. I think for just a moment, for just you know three minutes within a program. Again, mass entertainment audience to, to bring to bring a message uh, message there. Another channel, a channel four example, my family in the Galapagos, you know, the, the family that moved to the Galapagos to see what it meant to be sustainable, essentially. I guess the question there is, can all Britons go and live in the Galapagos to try and figure out if they can be sustainable? Don't know. That's certainly up for up for debate. And lastly, just a really interesting example, actually, which was the BBC's coverage of the Great Manchester Run, you know, running race. And in some of the time that they had to fill there they talked about an incredible charity that was planting trees in the city so perhaps the what didn't they do they didn't talk about the ecological emergency in the great manchester run but they did do a nice session about uh you know about about planting trees Richard, what do you think it is about you know these that that make them great or not or not so good what are your what are your thoughts i think um i think variety in all honesty i think you know we, we've talked about big shows and the power of big shows uh, and um you know, the, the, the choir there, the, the, the kids' choir, I genuinely had, a, I was quite surprised at how emotional I found that when I heard that. Um, those kind of big entertainment shows can be hugely powerful, but there is, but there is also power in, in uh, collective approaches to this, right? So I think this, you know, this works on a couple of levels. One is, as broadcasters, it is beholden on all of us to, to find ways on every single show. It's, it's actually not nearly as hard as we think. When we when we get off, when I think there's a, a kind of immediate response that um, that that if you don't if you don't delve enough into what planet placement actually is, you assume it needs to be right on the nose, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, it's some of the much more subtle ways of talking about things. Or in I May Destroy You, in a show that seems quite overtly about about other very very important significant um, issues, but actually, here's this kind of this climate message of sorts in there. There's really, and I, and I think those, I think I think those, um, the variety of those different ways of talking and and the volume of them is just as important as the big shows. 
actually yeah. the big show is going to attract I think I think sometimes there's a kind of divisiveness about uh, about hitting these issues head on for audiences where people who are already bought into these issues are immediately open to them and people who aren't can can kind of recoil and actually mm -hmm. I think those the, the ways in which you know scripted comedy and comedy entertainment or, or um, you know or um, uh, the scripted piece uh, Michaela's scripted piece there too I may destroy you you know the way that those shows can lead into this and can and kind of get those messages in in a way that's filtering into our brains but without having to hit us over the head with it is is enormously important I think we're going to find out what all 166 of you think now actually and launch a little poll <laughs> just to see if you if you like what you see um Siobhan, I think is putting it up for this magic there you go So are these examples, I appreciate we've shown you a broad examples, but generally, you know, is it a swing and a miss or anything's better than nothing? Do you think this is a great start or do you genuinely love what you're, what you're seeing here? Let us, uh, let us know and I'm sure our answer will pop up, up on the screen. And while we do that, I'll a question from you, hello. Yeah, I thought it'd be quite a good question for Laura, if I may. Um, so Bethan, thank you very much for your question. And she's made the point that there's so much focus in the media on the risks of climate change and what we're using. And, um, and while everyone accepts that it is a major, major issue, it is, and needs to be made clear, is it um, important in, in this discussion that we start to talk about the societal and economic benefits that come from that transition to a global carbon, carbon economy? Um, and how do we, I guess, in this sector, frame that transition as positive rather than as always as a cost? Oh, that sounds, that felt like a really big question. It is a really big question. <laughs> I mean, I think it's worth just saying that we're, we recognise, Aaron, don't we, that what we've done is look at climate terms and this, this, this the downside of our subtitle report, I suppose, if we're being really kind of critical of ourselves, it only highlights us talking about the issue and not the solutions. And I suppose that's where the skill can come in. It kind of leads on what, from what Richard was just saying as well. Um, yeah, and I, I, think, I think the question was saying, um, are, do, is there a sense that it's always framed as a negative rather than there's it being a positive thing to do? I mean, on ITV, we've been, we've actually recently actually I you know I've been really impressed with us as a as a company, not myself, but um, with the amount of program we're doing around climate change. You know, we just had Prince William doing a planet for us all, which was brilliant, which was a way to to bring people who just wanted to watch Prince William doing anything. Um, but there he is talking about what we need to do to improve the planet. We've got Torval and Dean coming up doing Dancing on Thin Ice. Who, what, who doesn't want to see Torval and Dean dancing in, uh, on a frozen lake in the middle of Alaska? But it's in the year that Alaska had its warmest year on record. So there's a kind of bringing, bringing people that viewers want to see and bringing stories that people want to see and wrapping it up in climate change is, is part of what we do. Entertainment, ITV is an entertainment channel. And we do want to entertain people fundamentally, as well as telling those important stories. Richard, do you worry that, um, oh, here's our poll results. Great, so we're so, uh, oh, great start, now let's get better. Okay, cool, well, I think <laughs> over res resounding response really that we, uh, we're, we, we've, we've hit the mark and now, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're getting there. I mean, one of the key challenges, Richard, coming to you as well, is that, especially with drama, really long lead times, you know, how long is it going to take the industry to, to turn this around? What, what do you think we might, where, where might these results be next year? Well, I mean, we hope they're all going to be, I mean, what I think was really interesting to see how, without a doubt, right, we've got an enormous job ahead of us still. But I, what I was really uh, pleased to see was, how swiftly those those references have grown, and and in my brain, if I if if I go back to my you know my basic maths learning and I extrapolate that out, I'd, we'd really like to see that exponentially rise again, right? But uh, you know, I, I think the bottom line is this is about all of us now, tomorrow when we go and have our next meeting with our producers uh, on both sides, producers and commissioners, picking up that conversation. So yes, you're right. There is there is, there is going to be some drama that is still coming through for the next six nine months that maybe we missed the opportunity to to talk about. Um, but but ultimately, it's beholden on all of us to to make a stand from now, effectively. 
I wonder if any of you had a story with an environmental theme that you didn't let through, that just kind of wasn't quite right, or have any advice for, you know, what, what should story producers and storytellers come, come to you? What are the key ingredients that are gonna, gonna work with you? And what are the things to, to avoid that you might have said no to over the last couple of years? Anyone? I think, if I, just very quickly, I think in anything that feels shoehorned in, Mm -hmm. I think, you know, to that point about, you know, you can, you can do things on a grand scale in a big entertainment show, but, but the subtlety of some of the smaller um, activations of this is really important. I think when you're, when you're in a show that isn't overtly about this subject area and you try and tackle it in, in, a, in a really blunt manner, it can have a negative effect, I think. So I think that's just about, it's just, just about course correcting rather than refusing to let people talk about it. Trisha, are you there hovering with a new question I can see? Well, I've got loads. I've got loads. Thank you, which one? So, first one for Amanda. Um, Fergus, thank you very, very much for this question. He asked, he noticed in the drama Life, which I love, by the way, um, some nice incidental references in the scripts to trying to cut down on me choosing the bus. He wondered, was that a, a purposeful sort of planet placement, placing, or and, and did you directly influence that, or did it just happen organically? Do you know what? I don't know. I'd have to find out. But I think um, with with all of our content, um, we are trying to have conversations at the beginning, at the point of commission, um, alongside diversity conversations and the other really important principles that, again, you want to run through the programming. Um, just to say, we welcome this. What are the opportunities for this? Where can we do it? But equally, it has to feel organic as well doesn't it and that was uh, all the examples that that you showed just now I think felt really organic they didn't they didn't feel like someone had, had, had wagged a finger and said you have to do this so that's why we have to go hand in hand with um the creative community and we have to get the sort of the writers at grassroots level engaged and 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 and, and we have to signal again that the things that matter to our audiences matter to us and and this matters to our audiences and equally um with the platform we've got we have we have a huge responsibility but but not being worthy with it that's the thing we always um are wary of so and that leads me to another very very good question i'd love to just get an indication from all of you about this so christine thank you for this question um she just wonders whether it's time for some naming and shaming so should we have a version of the best shell test and, and i don't know if everyone on the call is familiar with that but this is the um the test that that talks about how women are represented in films should there be an equivalent of the best shell test for environmental messaging should we be calling out programs that promote endless consumption and environmental damage. I guess Bechdel test is used generally in awarding grants and awarding, um, celebrating um, it through through the, the nature of awards. Is that something that you think would work? Or we should consider? Yeah, no, I'm, you're looking thoughtful. Very, very thoughtful. <laughs> There's something so sort of radical about it, I'm really drawn to it. I, I wonder instinctively what the end result of something like that would really be, because I think we're all in the business of managing the mixed economy of being public service broadcasters. So having loads of really important remit issues, as well as actually the mixed economy of going, I want to entertain you, and there should be reasons why you turn on and you need to relax with us. And actually the escapism of some of the shows that we get called out on the most, travel shows or shows that celebrate luxury in any way, um, I'd be conscious, I'd be too, I would be a bit worried about sort of, you know, being too hard on those sort of shows because it's escapism, right? We need a version of that. And so I think what's better is to just suggest that in the middle of that, you, your messaging changes and that you talk about things in a more responsible, forward thinking way. And, and that's not beyond anyone to do that. So I think the calling out is not necessarily about shutting down avenues of entertainment, just more about going, just update the messaging. I mean, and actually, if you don't, things will get left behind you know like Top Gear in two years time if, if you know I, I don't watch Top Gear I don't actually know what it's done to be honest but the idea I've never watched that show because it's always felt a bit too guzzly but that can't exist the way it has existed surely you know so how do those big shows evolve themselves the I big, know that, big, well, big win I think top, top Gear and the Grand Tour actually you know Top, top Gear have just done a really fascinating 30 minute piece 
fantastic on the future of electric vehicles and it debunked yeah. a lot of myths and it was really thoughtful and long it was 30 minutes so it can't have been it must have been just a, you know an online special but and also the grand tour with Clarkson you know he ran aground as a result of a changing climate he literally couldn't get his boat down the river and it kind of found its way into the narrative so I think they're coming kicking and screaming by virtue of filming in the world but, but um, they, anyway the big prizes shows with that many viewers doing this stuff is where you will change hearts and minds a bit right you know like it's amazing that they come on the journey with us. I think tracking the journey is a win. So if you can actually authentically track how difficult it is for people to engage with this, you've got an audience for it. I think I'm not into I'm not interested in watching people who are virtuously saying I'm doing everything right. So become like me or else. It's a real turn off. Much rather see the flaws and the difficulties and the comedy and the heartache and the the frustration right and the boredom of trying to do the right thing the whole time because that is human experience and mm. it, it the authentic we can all we're all really sophisticated viewers the viewing public in this country are really sophisticated you can sniff out inauthenticity like that and it doesn't it won't it won't do much for people that, I know, I know I'm only the host. That's hard to translate, I think. But. I'm, only, I'm only the host, but anyone who knows me knows I've got an opinion on everything. And yeah. I have to say, <laughs> I do worry that if we, if we really stick to a, you know, a planet test, you know, we just end up in cancel culture and woke yeah. culture and we leave a whole, you know, a whole part of the audience who need to come on this journey but behind us. So I, I think you know, things like the planet test have a, a role to kind of question creatives and, and a conversation between commissioning editors and producers but I'm not sure it should be a kind of iron a, you know iron fist in terms of only kind of that content can, can mm -hmm. be in our screen because surely that yeah, way lies danger. <laughs> Aaron you talk about the the brilliant scene in Big Little Lies that that spawned the big sort of conversation where the little girl um hides in the cupboard because she's so terrified about climate and what an enormous effect that had in terms mm. of being provocative and promoting debate but but Big Little Lies would fail any any planet yeah. test of that uh, best best test for, of that kind because it's like completely about glorious houses and cars and yeah and clothes yeah, totally so it, but, but, but that's speaking to an audience and I think we've got to we've got to leave the, the creators in control and and put the geographers on the back seat I think is what we <laughs> the answer there Trisha's back with a new question I think we might have just a couple more actually yeah I was so many questions and I'm so apologetic to all the people I don't get to but I think it is important I've got one big question for the commissioning editors at the end but actually there's been a couple of questions about the methodology which I guess Aaron you'll probably have to answer so a um, couple of themes so um, one specifically um, are, is it possible that all the environmental terms that uh, were, came out of the research only related to talks news or documentaries and if um, uh, uh, scripted was included with the language be different so that's question number one which I know you can answer and then the second question if I can find it is um, is it possible for us to measure the impact of the content um, um, that we're measuring in relation to the mood of the general public and what is being talked about in terms of, um, of sustainability is there a research method that we could use to try and draw those two things together so good let, luck me, let me just check my mood <laughs> of the public gauge <laughs> uh, which wouldn't that be a wonderful thing um, on the methodology you know we do include drama and, so, and, and the scripted in, in that analysis so that's a completely part of it but you know soft subtitles of the script we can only look for terms that we, you know we're looking for and we're not going to we're not going to see a recycling bin in the shop behind us so you know it is it is different um fact you know factual tends to talk about a topic where scripted tends to show so there is going to be a bias to finding things and we're actually having a conversation about what we do next year and i think we're going to have to supplement our quantitative data with our qualitative data so we make sure we're offering a, a kind of deeper deeper picture on, on on where we are really and in terms of the mood of the public I don't know it's tricky isn't it because who's to say whether a mention of top uh, climate change in top gear is worth three in blue planet or one in blue pizza you know I think there's so many uh, different audiences are in different places and uh, if whoever wrote that question has got an idea of the methodology there I'd, have, I'd appreciate a direct message to let us <laughs> a window a window into their a window their thinking so one one question for all of you before we bring Angela back actually and this is um a statement from um, Lord Putnam, actually, who's a BAFTA fellow and was chair of the UK Parliamentary Committee. He referenced a, a, a comment made by Eldridge Cleaver, who was an um, activist in, in the 60s um, for inclusion. 
he says the react in, in terms of climate change he says you're either going to be part of this you you're either part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem you can only really be one of those things at this unique moment in history richard i wondered what your thoughts are on where the industry is at at the moment well, I mean, where the industry is at, at the moment is probably a question for you, Aaron, but <laughs> for everyone, because you've got much better oversight of these things than we have. I think, um, you know, the, the one thing that you've talked about often when you've uh, come to see us at UK TV is about, uh, about timing, right? So we've, we've made some progress. We've made some small progress. I, I don't have a sense, actually, of where that progress is in terms of where we need to get to. Um, but but what, I, what I do know is that timing is critical as we've heard so often and that and that that time is running out and that there will be a point at which there is no return right so i think um i, I welcome any thoughts as to how we can get a bigger thirty-five thousand foot view on how we're doing um i think that's really important i don't i don't know all, all this, perhaps this is the moment to bring angela back in and angela you know from an economics point of view and a nudge theory point of view what are your thoughts on you know whether these small interventions you know peppered through all of our everyday content are really going to meet the challenge that we that we face ourselves in and, and how should the tv industry think of itself at the moment from your external perspective that's that is a hard one for me and i and i have i really enjoyed the, listening to you guys talking about this i'm i will not even presume to try and get the the points that you were making around <clears throat> nuance and, and authenticity you know you you know that stuff better than i do the thing i think i would say on um on solutions is I think would be really good would be to have um, a set of people who are commissioning and thinking about, as you said, like quiz questions and um, recipes and all those sort of things, really educated on what the big things that make a difference are because we can we all spend far, far too much time and, and, and some people will hate me for saying this, but talking about things that are not really gonna make a lot of difference. So recycling is lovely and it's really important, but it is not the most important thing you can do as a citizen. The, probably the biggest thing you could do as a citizen is what you said, Aaron, it's around your diet. And it doesn't mean you have to become vegan, but you might eat meat less. That's much more significant. And actually, for me, and I'm an economist and I'm interested in policy and, and, bus and business changes, the biggest thing you can do is just give the government a big kick up the arse and say, we need to get on with this. You know, this is not, um, as, as Mando was saying, something that we are going to put on the back burner and let you do after you've done you know, the 10 other things that you're making a mess of at the moment, you need to do this now. And that mandate is really important. And one of the things that came across from me from, from your conversation um, is, uh, I think we've gone past awareness. We've, we're well past awareness. The public may know about this. And there's a really good piece of work um, out by Climate Outreach this week that says, there's actually never been a topic that the public have agreed so strongly on. Uh, you know, take take leave, remain, old, young, north, south. Everybody's just like, get on with the green economy. That's it. But then we get into the really interesting stuff of like, oh, but I don't want you to do it that way. I don't, I don't like it in this version. I want this version. And that's where you get the anxiety and the tension and how's it going to work. And it doesn't work for the disabled. And it does work for you if you live in a detached house, but not if you live in a flat. And these things are the kind of interesting things that we need to start exploring. So I think getting into the solution space on these big issues um, and working out, which you can do much better than me, how you how you fit that into a programming. I think that's will take us forward. And I think we're just we're just, um, you know, telling people what they already know if we're just doing awareness still. So I think I read that as cautious optimism as long as we do our homework. Is that right? Yeah. And I think maybe, maybe <laughs> what we could do is really, um, you know, make sure that when we're speaking to this is this is the environment sector now when we're speaking to people who've got the reach um that you guys have we're talking to you about not just the public message the things that public can do because that ends up being sometimes like you know quite small stuff but actually the things that the public are going to experience are going to be their house changing their car changing the way they go i mean that they're going to experience those things and if they feel fearful of that then it, it stops it happening but they're not going to be the one who you know redesigns the electricity charging infrastructure for their street that doesn't that's not going to be their choice but they're going to be part of making it happen successfully or not because they'll be resistant and scared of it that's probably the place that they they fit in thank you 
Tricia, I wonder if we could come back to you for two final questions before we wrap up for today. Uh, well, so this is probably a question on behalf of everybody listening. Um, <laughs> some very, very funny comments as well, actually. Just before I ask a question, I just thought I would share this one. Somebody said, I would love to see them hire an eco-advisor on W1A. <laughs> yeah. And to play that character, it would be absolutely superb. Thank you very much for Jemima for that very, very good suggestion. I think we could all agree that that would be hilarious. Um, but the very simple, straightforward question is, um, um, where do we send our treatments, pitches, or ideas for environmental content? I don't want to assume that it's through the normal channel, so I will just put that out to you all for everyone that's listening. Yeah, always happy to hear ideas that, that feel like they're going to work for the audience and have environmental sustainability at their heart. There you go. Standard, standard route by the looks of it. <laughs> There's no easy wins here, folks. <laughs> I, I, I would say, um, I think we are, I mean, like all of us, we're, we're, we're discussing programming for next year in Glasgow, right? Hitting a tight, hitting program around, programming around key moments where climate's being discussed. So there are active briefs, I think, in the factual departments of Channel 4. That is not me. If you've got a good sitcom about an eco-organisation, Full of people desperately trying to sort the bureaucracy out about how to save the world. Send it to me, but uh, factual stuff, I would just go on for producers and look up the relevant department, whether that's fact ten features, uh, docs. They okay. they will have that brief there, and you can you can absolutely get into people now if you've got a climate agenda. Now's the time, actually. Cool, Trisha. One last question. Let Richard um, give Oh, his... sorry, I didn't hear that. Sorry, Richard, cut you off. Very okay. rude of me. No, no, not at all. As I say, from UK TV's point of view, you know, we, we are, we, we, I mean, the briefs are there. Can talk to the commissioners, uh, email them. But, um, but I would say that, you know, we're not overtly looking for environmental shows. What we are looking for is environmental issues being raised. And I think Angela has raised a really interesting point about the kind of weighting of those and, and how they're not all equal, right? But is, is those issues being raised in every single programme that we make? That's all we're interested in. Mm. Um, and so the, the last question is a little bit of a build on that, but um, has anything already been commissioned to take advantage of the fact that the spotlight will be on the UK with COP26 next year and will attract massive international audiences as we build up to next November? Is that on your agenda, is it on your radar? It is at Channel 4, I'm sure it will be at all broadcasters. I mean, we're actively looking and commissioning in that area at the moment. So I would expect that. I mean, my, weirdly, I'm wanting to ask a question about whether anyone thinks there's a sort of cross-party alliance here to be done with making some bit of content that is on every channel on one night at the same time. So that there is, I, I feel like sometimes we, we, we don't need to be competitive about stuff that is this important. and I, I'd love to, I mean, we've sort of talked that about that at Channel 4 a little bit, but if people do have ideas around that or how we could, what that message would be, maybe Angela, that's something we can talk about, but, you know, it's not recycling, it's this. And do you want me to do a climate change dance, Fiona? Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I don't know, I just feel like sometimes the bigger we get with this, the more profound it will be, and the fun, the funner it will be for us About all. About 20 people have just said yes, 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 in the chat to us to that idea, Fiona. Um, and actually, I Aaron and I, I have done some thinking we'll about talk. that, so we should pick up with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we definitely should. Well, guys, thank you. So, you know, I appreciate you know it stuck the journey with us all. 155 of you. Thank you so much for for joining. You know, we're Albert, we are just five people in an office. That's not particularly exciting, but you know. What we represent is the whole industry working together on environmental sustainability um, and I think that's exactly what we've done tonight actually so thank you to all of you um, for, for joining us and thank you so much to our fantastic speakers to Angela to Lara uh, to Richard to Fiona uh, who have I missed <laughs> I'm so sorry uh, to Amanda um, thank you um, lastly a huge thank you to our sponsors as well, Green Tomato Cars, Sergeant Disc and Good Energy, without whom we wouldn't be able to put on these um, events. Please don't forget to tell us what you thought on Twitter, on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, at, at We Are Albert. And thank you so much once again for joining us. Have a good evening. Good night. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Bye. Bye.